So, thank you very much for early morning. I can just barely see you guys. Uh, a very early morning star, very early, because I flew in at like 11 o'clock uh, last night. So, um, I'm Ian Forrester. That is my job title, Senior Fire Starter. I can, uh, you can ask me questions about that if you want to, but as it's more interesting things to talk about. So, this is the future of storytelling. Now, I know some of you are going, what? This is like a really old-fashioned picture. What is this about? This is not the future. What's this got to do with AI? Well, you'll find out. The key thing about the future of storytelling is actually it's more like this picture, okay? And if you have to kind of go way back, and that's what the picture is about. We're so stuck in this idea of storytelling being digital, broadcast, and even publishing. But there's this thing way, way past, you know, in the past, okay, called oral storytelling. And oral storytelling has always been there, okay? And it was oral, and it was very, very important because people... Actually, the Greeks used to go around and go to cities or go to places and tell stories. Um, there's other um, kind of lots of cultures that used to do this. And people used to come from miles around to hear that story. It was told orally. There was no written words. This is way before that. It was immersive, engaging, participatory, and adaptive. This is all the stuff that humans are really good at, okay? And this is what makes it a fascinating story. So, what has this got to do with anything? So, we're in the internet age now, okay? We're also in the AI age, or machine learning age, if you prefer. Um, and BBC R&D um, has been working on this technology called object-based media. Object-based media is basically what it says here um, on the, from the next web. It's basically just blowing up media into pieces, okay? And once those pieces are, are kind, of, um, kind of blown up, uh, then we can start to reassemble them in different ways. So, as it says in the next web, you know, it's about kind of breaking it up into tiny little pieces and then you know, reassembling it on the fly based around the metadata. So the metadata makes the media uh, machine addressable rather than kind of looking at it and going, okay, what's that, what's that, how does that fit, you know. Um, I can go into so much detail about this, but I won't because it will bore, bore you. Um, and I, the key thing about it is that all those objects, each of those objects, when you put them together, like Lego bricks, they start to make things. So you can take the same pile of Lego bricks and make a car you can make a house, you can make something else. I actually made a roller coaster with my Lego bricks, which did not turn out very well, but let's leave that for another story. Um, also, these, um, these, these bits also are, can be variables. They don't have to be just a solid piece of media. So you could say, based on the time of day, then this happens, or based on your, your name, um, then we in insert that instead. So you might have seen these books that um, you can buy for your children, and it would, you know, you send off and say, my child's name is Daniel, and then you get a book back that's, um, that says Daniel. And if you look at the actual, um, most of the kids, when they read the stuff, they really are, like, blown away by it, okay? Now, you see this all the time on the web, but we're doing this with, with media, in the media. This isn't an external thing happening. This is within the media. So it just looks like a video to you, or looks like, or it sounds like audio. And you can set any variable. So you could be based on context, location, environment, time of day, age, um, the personality of a person, which we can go into later. But it's on rails, okay? So I'm the storyteller. I'm telling you the story. You could stand up right now, and you could walk out, or you could even shout something. I could choose to ignore that, or I could choose to bring that into, into the story. It's up to me, as I'm the storyteller. So we believe that media has plenty more potential. And let me show you what I mean. So, oh, there you go. So the first thing we did is we did this audio drama six and a half years ago, 
um, which you can still listen to online. It doesn't work very well in Germany, unfortunately, but you can listen to it. Um, but it's based on your location, and so it will use your location to then input parts of the drama uh, with your location. Okay? It's, it's an interesting drama. It's, it feels very old, but it's worth listening to. We also created this, this um, responsive radio, which is a documentary which scales in length. So you can imagine if you are, you only want to spend, you know, I think you can do 12 minutes and 24 minutes, and you can move that slider. So if you only want to listen to it for 12 minutes, then you get a same documentary. If you yeah, extend it to 15, 20 minutes, then what happens is that you get more depth, okay? And it's all completely, all the stuff in between can be done, okay? So if you want 17 minutes and five seconds, then it will be 17 minutes and five seconds. So we also created Forecaster, because all the stuff up until now has been kind of audio. And if you would like to play the video, thank you very much, Mr. Tech. Forecaster from the BBC R&D Labs demonstrates how a new approach to delivering programmes would open the door to more personal, flexible experiences for our audiences. In this demonstrator, we transmit each of the media elements separately, and because of this, we have the ability to control each of these individual elements in isolation from one another. The timeline tracks you see at the bottom of the footage represent the timelines for each media object in the forecast. To illustrate this, you can see how the on-screen graphics can be toggled on or off, or the whole backdrop removed to reveal the raw green screen footage. By delivering content in this way, one of the biggest potentials lies in the enhancement of accessibility. Replacing the standard presenter with a signer is a first-class presence in the video, for example. Or rearranging the on-screen graphics when subtitle elements are present to avoid overlap. You could also change the background map to a higher contrast view to aid the visually impaired. If media were delivered in this way, we could also have the footage adapting to suit your screen size, rather than forcing a single aspect ratio or font size on all devices. Here, we can see how a mobile portrait view would look, with a larger font size and a rearranged view to include more of the map. In the future, we could also link content to your personal calendar or other third-party data services and feature relevant local information. As you can see, the ability to send media elements or objects separately rather than as a single video stream gives much greater flexibility for playback, allowing content to automatically adapt to the screen size and preferences of the viewer. The flexibility of an object-based approach won't just benefit audiences though. BBC R&D is also testing how it could make production more efficient, giving programme makers time to flex their creative muscles in new ways. We hope you have enjoyed the sneak peek into the potential of IP production in the future. This demonstrator does not represent a new service and has used non-broadcast maps and feeds only. If you would like more information, please contact max.leonard at bbc.co.uk Thank you. So you can see, and yeah, you know, it's kind of like, a, it's like Photoshop layers. You can kind of layer them, and but if you send them all as individual pieces, you can do more interesting things with it. So that is obviously a very uh, useful example, and as uh, Max said, it's about accessibility. But what happens when you apply this in drama? So um, I've created this thing called the perceptive drama. Um, it's visual perceptive media. Um, and it's a drama where there's two characters and they, it's a very basic story. It's literally someone walks into a cafe, someone meets someone at a cafe, they have a talk, they have an exchange, and then someone leaves the cafe. Real basic, okay? But out of that, um, we can create a lot of examples. So, I'll let Jasmine explain how it works. Can you play the video, please? Hi.
Our visual perceptive media project explores how to make content that is truly personal to you, changing to suit your preferences and aspects of your personality. The process of creating this adaptive content starts with a dedicated mobile app. Through data obtained from content like your listening habits and questions about your personality, a profile is built and stored in the cloud that the Visual Perceptive Media web client can access to alter different aspects of the resulting film. The answers you give to the questions will shape the narrative flow of the film, as will aspects like your age and gender. The action may change in some scenes, or the shot may favour one character over another. Some scenes may be missing entirely. Data that reflects your general outlook will affect the appearance of the film. Meanwhile, individual media preferences, like listening history, will shape the film's score. At the moment, all the data is generated by the mobile app. However, in the future, the data could be generated by any number of services, and the object-based nature of perceptive media means it could respond to a user's mood in real time. The results are one film that can be tailored for everyone's individual preferences and can give different repeat viewing experiences depending on factors like your location, the time of day and your mood. New content experiences, like visual perceptive media, are only made possible by BBC R&D's research into advanced broadcast techniques, such as object-based media and IP production. The adaptive narratives are made possible by having a story made up of individual objects, which are assembled in your web browser using the app data as a guide. This approach to storytelling does not remove the creative process of filmmaking. Rather, it allows production teams to explore new modes of storytelling for diverse audiences. Visual perceptive media does not represent a new service. It is an example of how BBC Research and Development... What's the next slide? <laughs> I'll switch back. Okay. I don't know what happened there. Ah, okay, okay. All right, so um, the key things we can create, we've created out of that very simple thing, we, we can create 50,000 plus variations. And I say variations, not versions, because they're important, there's slight differences, but those little tweaks here and there can really change the feel of the story. Um, yeah, variations, not versions. And I think of it like the end of Interstellar, okay? Um, and it's kind of like mind-boggling and, and kind of like it's, really, it's a lot to take in, you know, creating all these variations. Yeah, here's the maths for it if you're interested. Um, and you can see that, you know, so we basically we've got this map of the story and you can see this is just eight variations and each one's slightly different. Not massively, but you could do things like if you put one video ahead of the other, so if you put the the woman walk into the cafe um, before the man. Then what, there's a trick in Hollywood where the first character you see is the character you build in the emotional, um, you build a kind of emotional thing with. And so if you switch it around the other way, then you suddenly got something different. You know, and how much you see, so there's a bit where she's, she's holding her belly, so you think she's pregnant, you know, stuff like that. We can remove or, or you know, and it's just by, ed, by, it's all the magic of editing but we're doing it live in the browser, and that's really key. So, oh, yeah, it's the small things. I'll skip that. And Hollywood's been doing this for donkey's years, yeah. Um, there's also, so this is an example, if you've seen Little Sky, um, there is a scene, I won't spoil it for anyone that hasn't seen it, there's a scene where Penelope Cruz and Tom Cruise are walking down this slightly snowy road, and Later on, you find out that that's taken from the album cover of Freewheeling Bob, by Bob, Bob Dylan. And when I first saw that, I had a, like a deja vu before I even saw the album cover. And I couldn't work out why. What I realized is that actually, I, when I was young, I used to flip, this is to show my age, I used to flip from my mum and dad's LP collection. And my mum and dad had that LP and somewhere, when I saw that vision, I, I felt like I'd been there, even though I hadn't been there. That's magical. That's the kind of thing you could do. Super highly relevant. And as, if you've seen Seven, something in a box is very relevant for one of the characters. 
Yes, so relevance is something that we do on the internet quite well. However, it's masterful storytelling, and not all of us are that great. Could machine intelligence help us? Good question. If you've seen where this is from, uh, was it Sunspring? I, I don't know what to say except for um, this is not a good example of masterful storytelling in any way. And I think it's because they fed it, they fed the machine intelligence a little script, a little Hollywood scripts. And actually, that's a problem. You put garbage in, you get garbage out. And it, it, uh, it is garbage, I think, personal view. And also, algorithms have a huge amount of bias because we're just feeding it the same old garbage that we think would work. And actually, we need to rethink that. You know, so you might have seen this, which is a, a very striking example of the bias in algorithms that are generated by, by uh, the amount of stuff that's kind of fed to the machine intelligence, which is a real problem. So we've, we're doing a whole bunch of work around data ethics, as we call it, um, and it covers all these things. Because if you start going into privacy, you get stuck into there, and if you talk about security, you get stuck in there. We look at it as a kind of a complete thing, you know, what is the data ethics? You know, how does that work? That's what we're interested in. And it's a key part of the BBC. You know, trust is the foundation of the BBC. If we mess up, if I feel like I messed up on visual sets video or anything else like that, I feel like the, it's the end of the BBC. And that's a problem, a big problem. I think that there needs to be some more transparency in algorithms. And this is some of the stuff that we are actually working on right now. So, you should be able to know, why did I get that version, or that variation, sorry, of, of visual set media, and your friend saw something else. And it should be able to literally tell you why and how. And that's something that I think a public service company should be able to do, and should, you know, should definitely encourage others to do. I think of it like the x-ray mode. You should be able to, if you want to, press a button, and you should be able to see what's going on underneath. Now, I know this is a big problem for commercial companies and startups who are like, that's our secret source, but we're the public service, we're public service, and we're not interested in that. We're interested in, in telling people what's going on underneath. And I think that's really important. We are actually doing, um, uh, what's it called, a satellite event um, tomorrow, if you're interested, um, and I think it's three o'clock. Uh, come and speak to me afterwards, or look for machine learning, trust, and public service, and you'll find it. There's also a thing about you know, creativity and art, because if you look at Sunspring, is that creative, or is that art? Is that, you know, good question. Um, I think it's about you know, leaving some of the stuff behind. Now, I think some of the AI stuff is starting to address some of that, you know, um, and it's getting better. So there's some really good art by two machines kind of like, always like batting in between each other, which is good. But also I think the, the important thing is that we're not still not quite ready for that yet. So if you look at, you know, I can't believe 20 years ago, Deep Blue, you know, battled and, and won a chess game, you know, and now 20 years later, look at where we are. And even he says, don't fear intelligent machines. We need to embrace it a little bit, you know, because also, if you do embrace it, then you get these transcendent moments, like AlphaGo, you know. Um, there's some things that the machines can teach us and we can teach them. And I think it's a, it's, a, it's a synergy of both. And if you bring that to storytelling, you can do some incredible things that you couldn't do um, you know, before, which is really important. So, quickly, some, some media reaction. So people picked up on the, uh, the bias stuff, which is interesting. Um, also, lots of questions about the shared experience. Are you destroying the shared experience? I've actually been called out for killing the shared experience. And I kind of asked, is this the shared experience we're talking about? Because I've not seen a living room like that for a long time. This is the living room of, of current, yeah? The TV, you notice, the TV is really small. People are not even looking at the TV, you know? And should they? We could try and force them, but why? What's the point? You know? 
I think the share experience is now around the Internet of Things, or could be around the Internet of Things. And we created this radio, which is a physical radio, but plays object-based media stuff back and has sensors so it can adapt to what you're doing in the living room. I guess you can feel it like an Alexa, but it's not Alexa. I think of this as hyper-reality experiences, and that is just my name for it. It may not be the right, right name. It was, I used to call it mixed reality, and then the VR guys took that. So. There we go. And I think it's about the devices in your room all working together to tell a much richer experience, and an experience that only all of you together can experience, rather than it be personalized to a person. I think we can create better stories together using AI and using machine intelligence and using human intelligence. Media which bends to your context. New types of learning experiences. And the key thing is that we're open sourcing all the stuff that we have done because we're a public service organization. We want, we want people just to take it and to do stuff. So you don't end up with like Sunspring so you end up with something that's actually really good, you know? So I think we can make storytelling human again with better AI and better machine intelligence and better human intelligence. That's it. Thank you for listening. Any questions? Uh, so I have one question for you. Yep. Um, I, I really love the, the fact that we could potentially personalize a lot of media um, a lot more than we have been doing now, and we can actually give us some positive role models that uh, actually you know, feel like, like they're, we're part of them or we can identify with them. But just as Facebook gave us the, the, the stream that's completely personalized to you, uh, are you not afraid that the future might, be, might become an echo chamber if we move too far in this direction? Yeah, so um, one of the things that the, the first slide that I had with the Daily Mail, they talk about the kind of the bias and it is about a filter bubble. And this is one of the things we do not want to have. Now we recognize that this is why this is the risk with like just giving it away. Someone will do that. I actually had a video which um, which shows the black mirror where you know there's stuff like that. And ultimately there will be people that will do that, but we're not going to do that. We're going to show incredible examples where we're not forcing you to to focus on the stuff that you already know. We're gonna introduce stuff that's like a little bit different, but also not too far. So if you know the person's here and you wanna move them that far, you don't, if you move them all the way over there, they might go, oh, switch off, go somewhere else. So if you slowly take them on the journey, then suddenly you get somewhere where actually they've learned and they've, they've become more enlightened because they're slowly building towards the thing, which is really more interesting. Very cool. Thank you so much, Ian. Okay. That was perfect. Cool.